A blessed Lord's Day morning to you. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I'm Pastor Greg Cheslick, and I want to welcome you to the celebration of worship on the Lord's Day. I'm in the sanctuary at 4th Avenue United Methodist Church in Faribault, Minnesota. We're still not meeting yet in the sanctuary, but I hope soon we'll be able to do so as we continue to pray for the COVID-19 situation to be uh, brought under control and for more and more people to receive the vaccine. I hope you've had a wonderful Christmas season and now we enter into the new part of the year. Today we celebrate the baptism of Jesus and reflect on the meaning of his baptism and ours as we seek to renew our faith. Let us now prepare our hearts to worship God and to celebrate the mystery of faith by lifting up our voices in song. <laughs> Jesus at his baptism in the River Jordan. You revealed him as your own beloved son. Awaken us, your children, born of water and the Spirit, to the wonders of your forgiving love and redeeming grace, and fill us anew with the power of your Spirit. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever, and all God's people say, Amen.
Acts of the Apostles. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast, where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed, he asked them. No, they replied, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul said, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them. And they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There was about twelve men in all. Here ends the first lesson. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. This messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all of the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the river Jordan. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food he ate locusts and wild honey. John announced, Someone is coming soon who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to stoop down like a slave and untie the straps of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. One day Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart, and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved Son, and you bring me great joy. Here ends the gospel, reading of the Gospel. On my desk, in my office, I have this jar. This is the result of a children's sermon that I gave just a couple a year and a half ago. It was about the filling of the Spirit. In this mason jar, I put some, I filled it up with some marbles first. And I asked the children, can you get any more in here? Is there anything else that you can put in here? And they said, oh, it's filled up. Then I took out uh, some sand and I began to throw sand in there and pour sand in it. And it would it would just cover up the marbles and all and more and more capacity was discovered in this jar then i asked the kids is it filled up now and they said yes and then i took out a pitcher of water and i began to pour water in here and more and more water could also be found room in the jar this jar reminds me that God has never finished filling us with his spirit. He's always got more room in our hearts and lives for more of him. And we should pray and ask and seek for more and more of him. This jar on my desk reminds me to continuously pour out my soul to God, expecting and asking for more. On Christmas Eve morning, I got a phone call. I was awakened from my slumber at 5 a.m. One of my kids called because they went out to start their car to go to work, living in the streets of Minneapolis. You remember that wonderful snowstorm we had two days before Christmas. It was a cold night, and this car wouldn't start. My child called roadside assistance and waited and waited and waited and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, no one had come to the rescue. So the call was made to dear old dad, and I was able to go up and help start the car, give it a jump start, and immediately the car started. 
Well, a few days later, I took the car to the uh, to O'Reilly's over in Northfield and discovered that the, the battery was not only not able to start because of the cold weather, but there was something deficient in the battery. It had lost its charge and wasn't keeping its charge. I didn't know what to give that child for a birthday, for a Christmas gift, and suddenly, suddenly I knew exactly what to do. To buy a new battery and put it in the car. That incident with the battery reminded me of our own common experience with New Year's resolutions. We make a list of things that we want to accomplish in the new year, the habits that we want to eliminate from our lives. We might want to prioritize certain kinds of activities or improve a relationship in our lives. Most of us want to lose weight, exercise more, and get ourselves healthy. We might want to put a dent in our bucket list, make some personal accomplishments. We create a big to-do list. But it's well documented that by February 1st, people start with great anticipation, great commitment, great willpower, great desire to see change. And by February 1st, they're discouraged, they feel defeated, they lack the discipline, and they simply scrap the resolutions. The need for a new battery, our experience with making and keeping New Year's resolutions, reminds me of the believers in the story in Acts chapter 19. The Apostle Paul is on his third missionary journey in Ephesus. His task is to encourage the Christian believers and strengthen their faith. He comes to a group of believers and he's engaging with them and he senses within them a bit of a deficiency in their faith. And so he lovingly asks them a probing question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Paul desires to see these brothers and sisters in Christ experience the fullness of God and the power of faith and to be fruitful in the Lord's work. To their credit, these believers respond with humility and vulnerability and openness. They say, no, we haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, there's the problem. They're lacking Holy Spirit power. They're deficient in their knowledge of the faith. There's something that they need to learn, something that they need to grasp a hold of in order for their faith to be truly fruitful, for God's work in and through them to flourish. And therefore, they find themselves somewhat stuck, relying on their own human strength. And contrary to the old adage, ignorance is not bliss. But what I love about these infantile believers is their humility, their honesty, and their teachable spirit. Paul continues his ministry of encouragement by exploring some more with them, asking them, and what baptism did you experience, he asked. And they replied, the baptism of John. Paul responded, John's baptism called for repentance from sin. Now, John the Baptist was a powerful instrument in the hands of God. His mission was to prepare the way for the Messiah, prepare hearts for Christ's message and his ministry. He called the Jews to repent of their sins, to leave them behind and rid themselves of their sinful ways. He called them to a baptism of repentance, to get ready for the one who was coming. John's ministry was to point to one who was coming, who would baptize them not with water, but with the Holy Spirit. These believers in submitting to baptism had made the all-important first step. They had responded to John's message and submitted to a baptism of repentance. They were willing to really look at themselves, to resolve to get their house in order in, an, in as much as it depended upon them, and to engage in some moral improvement. They had made a great and important first step, 
but there was something essential that was missing. And I think that's where you and I often find ourselves. We are like that car that's been shocked by extreme cold temperatures that just won't start. And even when we crank up our own efforts for a momentary burst of self-will, it's as if we're powered by a battery that can't hold its charge. We want to do better, we want to be better, and we want more for our lives. But as hard as we try, as resolved and as good as our intentions are, we get discouraged. We feel defeated, we lose momentum, we throw, end up throwing in the towel and settling for the status quo. Paul continues to minister to these well-intentioned souls with this powerful word of wisdom. But John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come, meaning Jesus. These Ephesians had taken the all-important first step of turning away from their sinful ways, but here was the next step that they must follow. They needed to turn from sin to the Savior, they needed to seek the power of the Holy Spirit in their life of prayer. They needed to invite Jesus Christ to bring them a renewed life in his name. You see, the risen Jesus is the difference maker. The risen Jesus is the great game changer. The risen Jesus is the life giver, the divine spark, the transformer battery with the power to give us a get up and go under normal circumstances, and under extreme circumstances. How easy it can be for us church people to come to believe that we're all right the way we are. We think to ourselves, we're good people, we're moral people, we're honest, we're polite, we're responsible, we pay our bills, we fulfill our commitments, we're good to our family and friends, we're good to our neighbors, we're cordial to strangers. We attend church and we support the church and good causes. We step forward to volunteer our time and help where we can. Well, these are all good qualities for sure. Admirable, necessary, worthy of being emulated. But it doesn't go far enough. We are like the believers in Ephesus who the Apostle Paul encountered in, in Acts chapter 19. It's so easy for us to simply go through the motions of morality but lack the power, the mojo of the Holy Spirit. We are well-intentioned people for sure, but do we really go to the wellspring of God's grace where the power to transform our lives can be found. God wants so much more for us, and God wants so much more from us, and God's vision for our lives can only come to fruition when he does something more in us. And what blocks the full flow of God's grace and power in us? It's our pride. It's our lack of understanding how much we really need God. We forget that apart from God, we can do nothing of any lasting significance. We think of ourselves as moral persons, and we, we probably are. But sometimes we allow sin to creep into our lives. We permit sin. We no longer confess our sins. We no longer cry out to God for strength to overcome. And sometimes our prayer life is so shallow. Oh, we say a few thank yous. But we say more, God, bless me. We don't really cry out for God to release his power in us, to really cleanse us from our sins, to really help us to fulfill God's will. Do we really take time to turn to the word of God to learn from God, to allow God to speak to us, and then seek 
by the power of the Spirit to be obedient to what God says. And sometimes when the going gets tough, we just quit. We don't persevere in, in, in prayer. We back up and rely on our own strength and power. Confession, prayer, scripture, fellowship with other believers, living in obedience to God's commands, loving God with every fiber of our being, all our hearts, souls, minds, and strength, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. These are the means of grace. These are the means by which God's transforming work is at work in our hearts and lives. This is how you and I tap into the power of God. And that power is the great game changer in our lives. In doing so, we turn from sin to the Savior. We seek the power of the Holy Spirit in our life of prayer. We invite Jesus to bring a renewed life in his name into our lives. He is the great difference maker, the game changer, the life giver, the divine spark. And yes, the transformer battery, it gives us the get up and go when things are tough. He works in us in everyday circumstances and under extreme conditions in which our lives are lived. When these well-intentioned believers heard the call to turn to Jesus Christ, they did not put up a wall of pride and rest on their good deeds, their morality, their moral character. Rather, they submitted to baptism in Jesus' name. They opened themselves up to a fresh work of God. Paul laid his hands on them and prayed, and a breakthrough occurred. Instantly, a breakthrough occurred among them their hearts were warmed, their speech was peppered with God's grace, and their actions were transformed. Something new, something fresh, something that gave praise to God was different about them. As we move into 2021, remember this. God wants so much more for us. And God wants so much more from us. And God desires so much more to do in us. And for God's vision for our lives to come to fruition, for our faith to really flourish, for us to be the great difference makers that God wants for us for the sake of the world, God must do more in us. So right here at the beginning of a new year, let's come to God with a teachable spirit, with a humble spirit, and let us turn to God as if our very life depends upon it, because it does. Let us call upon his name. Let us turn to his word and seek to be obedient to what he says. Let us engage deeper in the life of prayer and truly listen for his direction and for his loving correction. And let us simply focus on being obedient to whatever God says. Bring those New Year's resolutions and lay them before the feet of the Lord. But seek not to fulfill those resolutions with willpower and grit. Focused on self-improvement and personal accomplishments. Simply lay them before the Lord. And instead, seek God. Seek God above all things and seek first his kingdom. Call upon Jesus Christ daily for his saving help. Turn to God's word, seeking to understand his will and ready to be obedient whatever he says. Invite God's grace to transform you and make you new. 
But this is the very core of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And when you and I respond to the call for renewal, the Spirit will grant breakthroughs in our lives. The Spirit will deepen our faith and our trust in God and His promises. The Spirit will give us a holy passion for the things of God. The Spirit will make us fruitful in God's service. This is the great difference maker, Jesus Christ, in our lives. Let us welcome his work in us. Let us pray. O oh God, we who are the baptized call upon that same spirit that came upon us in, in the sacrament of baptism. Come and renew our lives. Come and wake us up to the wonders of your grace. Come and give us the power to overcome sin. Come. Give us a holy passion for the things of God. Come, work in us and through us and give us more and more of you so that we can be more for you, for the world. Let this be so. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people say, Amen.
Let us begin our prayer with our church's breakthrough prayer. O God, our God, we praise and magnify your name. Great are you, Lord, and greatly to be praised. With you, all things are possible. We know that you are with us and for us, and your plans are for our good, for a future and a hope. Break through into our lives and into our church. Stir up afresh our faith. Set our hearts aflame with the fire of your love. Open our eyes to new, fresh possibilities and fill us anew with the power of your spirit. Usher us into a new season of faithfulness and fruitfulness for your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We lift up before you our beleaguered nation, battered by a stressful year, a summer of tensions, protests, and riots, a bitterly contested election shrouded in suspicion. The events of this past week at the Capitol have left us greatly troubled. The election has now been settled, but this will hardly calm the turbulent waters that surround us as real distrust, feelings of disenfranchisement, and division fester among us. Give us eyes to awaken from our slumber that dulls our senses to the evil forces that plague us as people. Expose the media's propaganda that confuses and deceives, the corruption that conceals true motives and thwarts needed reform, the dishonest, exaggerated rhetoric that demonizes our fellow citizens and poisons our national discourse and sows seeds of distrust. And Lord, we come against the evil forces that threaten to divide and destroy our beloved nation in Jesus' name. Humble us, Lord, and lead us to seek you with our whole hearts. Bring us to our knees in repentance for our sins and wickedness and grant us your forgiveness. Heal our national soul. Renew and revive our love for you and our neighbor. Restore us as one nation under God and heal our land. Be with those, we pray, who are in need of your comfort, your protection, and your healing touch. Be with Ivy and Thor and Dorothy and Sarah and Bob and Bonnie. Especially, Lord, Touch with your healing mercies those who are afflicted with COVID-19. We remember before you all who have died, marked with the saving cross of Christ in baptism. May they know the fullness of joy you promise in heaven and comfort their families and all of us with the glorious promise of eternal life. Lord Jesus Christ, you submitted to baptism to claim us as your beloved people, cleansed from sin and saved for eternal life. May we who have received your gracious gift devote ourselves to pleasing you and advancing your kingdom. For we ask these things through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm so glad you've tuned in. I hope that you've had a wonderful season of Christmas, and now we're moving on to the next part of the year. I hope that 2021 has begun well, and that you feel optimistic about what 2021 will bring. I know that God has wonderful things and blessings in store for us, but if we truly want to receive all that God wants for us, we need to turn to him with fervent prayer and hearty devotion, and a readiness to turn to the Word of God and, and dig in to His promises. If we will do that, 
If we'll seek God above all else, he will fulfill the desires of our hearts. That is his promise. So let us go in peace now to love and serve the Lord. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go to serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. Go in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people say, Amen. Thank you.